Ask for Church family and friends. So glad you joined us this morning. God bless you. It's time for today's message. We're up to part nine of our sermon series, The Playlist for a Good Life. And so today we're going to move into chapter two of the book of James, and we're going to talk about the criticism of favoritism and obeying the law of love. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to serve. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to proclaim your word to your people. Now use me, Lord, the words I say. May they be comforting to your people encouraging to your people and true to your word in jesus name amen so let's turn to james the second chapter verses 1 through 13. my brethren do not hold the faith of our lord jesus christ the lord of glory with partiality for if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place and say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God. Well, as I shared a few weeks ago when we began our study of James, James is writing to his Jewish brothers and sisters of the diaspora, those who have fled Jerusalem in the wake of heavy persecution. Under the threat of death, they have left behind their families, their homes, their businesses. 
Life was hard emotionally, life was hard physically, socially, and spiritually. So James is offering some practical common sense advice for dealing with those types of situations, for dealing with trials and temptations, and how to build confidence and keep faith alive. So in chapter one, he encourages readers to do a couple of things. One, to count it all joy when you fall into trials. To let patience have its perfect work. As Paul said, patience produces character, character hope, and hope doesn't disappoint. To ask God for wisdom. To be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. To be doers, not just hearers of the word, and <laughs> to not be a forgetful hearer. So here in chapter 2, the first thing James does is offer what I like to call kingdom criticism about worldly favoritism or showing partiality. Treating people differently because of their status, their financial status, their social status, their political status, their ethnicity, their outward appearance. If you do that, James says that is contrary to the character of God. Impartiality is the attribute of God. God is an impartial God. Deuteronomy 10, 17 says, For the Lord, your God, is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. Yet, throughout history, people in society have been treated differently based on a lot of things. Their amount of money, their status. And it's not right. Just because society equates money with power and influence doesn't mean that God does. In fact, God doesn't. And so James is saying three things about showing favoritism or partiality. He says, one, it discourages people. Number two, uh, favoritism or partiality glorifies greed and ignores the need. And number three, favoritism or partiality breaks the law of love. Do you remember the segment on Sesame Street? It was called, One of These Things Is Not Like the Other. They put up three or four images like I have here. Let's say a walnut, a pecan, a cashew, and a boot. And clearly three of those items had something in common, but one didn't. And so they had a song that went along with it. It said, one of these things is not like the other. One of these things just doesn't belong. Can you tell which thing is not like the other by the time I finish this song? It's a great segment. Of course, the idea was to help teach children how to sort objects into like and unlike categories. And listen, knowing how to sort objects is a good thing. James, however, is suggesting that sorting people into like and unlike categories is not a good thing. He says it discourages people. And he used that example of two men coming into church. One has gold rings, fine clothes. The other is poor. His clothes are raggedy. His clothes are dirty. And the ushers would seat the man in his gold jewelry on the front row. But the poor man doesn't get to seat, sit on the front row. In fact, he may not get a seat at all. And so as I understand it, in churches in those days, they didn't have much seating anyway. They only had a few benches. And so the rest of the congregation really would have to sit on the floor. And those good seats, well, these Pharisees would come in and demand that they get the good seats. And so what ended up happening is the people uh, thought to be the most religious, the people thought to be the most educated and wealthy, they got VIP seating, and those poor sinners had to sit on the floor. These early believers, think about this now, who were themselves shunned and excluded and persecuted in Jerusalem for not being like the others, they themselves are now excluding other people because they are considered to be not like them based on social and financial status. And it did nothing to empower and build faith. Hebrews 11 and 6, 6 tells us the importance of faith. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. This favoritism, this partiality that James is talking about, 
can happen in a whole bunch of places and spaces. It can happen at church. It can happen in your family, in your home. It can happen at work. It can happen at school. And it's got a lot of names. It is partiality. It is favoritism. Some folk call it discrimination, racism, prejudice, chauvinism, bigotry. See, anytime you give preference to one person or group over others that have equal claims, that is favoritism. Equal claims. In other words, we're all children of God. Now, let me be clear. I think there are times when we need to honor people differently because of who they are or the position they hold with us. It's not favoritism if I honor my wife better than I honor another woman. They don't have equal claim to me. That is my wife. She has the right to be treated and honored differently. Same for my children. But it's when we treat people differently who are just as much a child of God as we are, that is the sin of favoritism. Favoritism does not empower people. It discourages people. I thought we were in the faith building, the kingdom building, the, encourage, the, the encouragement business. And then number two, when we show favoritism or partiality, it actually glorifies what doesn't need to be glorified. It glorifies greed and, and ignores the needs. You see, poor people then and poor people today uh, are treated differently. They're taken advantage of. And so these very folk, these very folk who are coming in here, demanded that they be favored, demanded that they be pampered, and then getting it, this were the very, these were the very people who were abusing the poor. They were underpaying their workers. They were dragging folk to court. They were exploiting the legal system for their own benefit. And they were bad-mouthing Jesus. They were bad-mouthing Jesus. Don't succumb to the temptation to devalue somebody based on their outward appearance. Do not succumb to the temptation to think more highly of yourself because of who you are and what you have. That would be an improper self-estimation. You're not all that. There's no VIP section in heaven. You may have access to box seats at the Texans game, but there are no box seats in heaven. It's general admission seating. Don't miss what James says in verse 5 of chapter 2. He says, listen, my brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? See, it's not about being rich with money. God wants us to be rich in faith. And you don't have to have a whole bunch of money to be rich in faith. The way to amass a fortune in faith is to live out loud for Jesus Christ, to live out the love of Jesus Christ. James said that faith is just not something that occupies space in your head. It is reflected in how you live every day. No one is insignificant or worthless in the eyes of God because of what they don't have. When we cater to people because of what they have and we don't focus on the greater good of the least, the last, and the lost, we glorify greed and we ignore the need. Number three, favoritism breaks the law of love. Verse 8, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. You do well. You cannot be religious enough. You cannot be good enough. You cannot be holy enough to somehow think you earned enough credits now that you're excused from uh, the law of love, loving, loving your neighbors. Loving your neighbor is the royal law. And you know, this concept of neighbor in your scripture isn't just the person that you live next door to. No, it's anyone who is in close proximity to you. The person you live next to, the person you work next to, uh, the person you're standing next to in the H-E-B, that's your brother. And whether or not your neighbor is a believer in Jesus Christ or not, there are no distinctions. That's your brother. One love, no favoritism. Serve those in need, regardless of who they are, where they've been, or what they believe. There's just nothing 
uh, trivial uh, about acts of favoritism. I mean, look at verses 10 and 11. He says, for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. What does he mean by that? Well, yes, here, listen. The immediate consequences of adultery and murder are different. I get it. There, there's a lot more immediacy if somebody dies than if somebody is cheated on, if you're an adulterer. But no sin is insignificant, is what he's saying. Showing partiality or favoritism is really a sign of spiritual immaturity. When Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray, he encouraged them to ask God to forgive them of their trespasses as they forgave those who trespassed against them. When we placed our faith in Jesus Christ, he forgave us. He treated us just like he treats anyone else who would place their faith in him for salvation. Our wealth didn't matter. Our skin color didn't matter. Our education didn't matter. What we look like didn't matter. Our gender didn't matter. Our history, our past did not matter. Equal treatment under the law of love. When we don't treat people equally, then we are demonstrating that we really don't understand what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. When we treat people differently with partiality, we are really saying that we don't understand what it meant for God to so love the world that he would send his only begotten son so that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. We want everlasting life. We want to treat people as God treats us. Nobody is outside the boundary of neighborly love. In the eyes of God, no one is unlovable. So, let's not be a love lawbreaker. Let's not glorify greed, but meet needs. And let's encourage people in Christ, because that's what God called us to do. And that is certainly what God has done for us. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Can we pray for you? We'd love to pray for you and your family. Please send us an email to aumc at ashfordumc.org. And our prayer team is standing by to pray for you. Thank you for your continued generosity. If you'd like to share a gift with us, feel free to do so. The information about how to share your gift is on the screen. You can go to our website at ashfordumc.org and click the Give button. You can text to give as well. Uh, listen, you can uh, mail in your gifts uh, if you would like. Multiple ways to be generous, and they're listed again right there on your screen. Lord, I thank you for your word that has gone forward. I thank you, Lord, that because it is your word, it never returns void. I pray that those that heard it, receive it and believe it. In Jesus' name, Lord, bless the gifts and the givers. Amen. So thank you so much for being with us today. We certainly invite you and encourage you to join us in our sanctuary each and every Sunday at 11 o'clock. We're 2201 South Derry Ashford Road on the west side of Houston. We'd love to worship with you and your family. We have an outstanding children's ministry, our Kids Zone Volunteers, Kids Zone, K-I-D, Kingdom Intelligence Development Zone. We want to teach your children the word of God on their level, ages six weeks to 12 years of age. And listen, I want to invite you to come and go with us to the Holy Land. We're going to be going to the Holy Land in January of 2024. There's the information. There's a QR code. Scan that code right now. It'll give you all the information that you need. Come and join us. We're putting together a great group. It's going to be a bucket list trip for a lot of people. Perhaps it's on your bucket list as well. Don't wait. Come on and decide to go with us now. We would sure love to be with you in the Holy Land. Well, I send you forth each and every week with three questions. I provide the questions, you know the answers. Who's the head of this church? Jesus. Who is the church? We are the church. And what are we as a church called to do? We're called to serve. God bless you. I love you. I'll see you next time.